In this video, I'm going to cover the shape of molecules, the geometry of a molecule, and how to determine whether or not that molecule is polar. So the first thing that we should look at is um, what's called the dipole moment of a molecule. So that's a measure of bond polarity. So remember for a bond to be polar, remember a bond is like a tug of war between electrons. So when two atoms have a different value of electro for electronegativity, then the atoms that is more electronegative tends to pull the electrons closer toward it in the bond, and the atom that's less electronegative has its electrons kind of taken away. So, so a, a, for a bond to be polar, all we're looking for is a difference in electronegativity. Um, and when we are assessing whether or not bonds are polar, that's the first step in determining whether an entire molecule is polar. So um, in previous videos, all we've looked at so far is just whether or not one bond in a molecule is polar based on the electronegativity values of the two atoms. But in order to determine whether that entire molecule is polar, it's not enough to just say there's a polar bond in this molecule, therefore that molecule is polar. We have to look at all of the polar bonds in the molecule and we have to look at the shape of the molecule. What, it, what are the angles between those bonds? And there is some interplay between the dipole moments. So sometimes uh, polar bonds can cancel each other out. Um, just like a plus and a minus, will, although there are, there are two charges, a plus and a minus, we would say that entire molecule is neutral because the plus and the minus cancel each other out. So in a similar sense, depending on how the dipole moment in a molecule works, that entire molecule may not be polar, even though it contains polar bonds, because those polar bonds might cancel each other out. So um, a dipole moment is just one way that we measure that bond polarity. So a, just like a polar bond has a plus end and a minus end, the plus end is the less electronegative atom that's losing electrons, and the minus end is the more electronegative atom that's gaining electrons. So the dipole is just what we call that, uh, that uh, the measurement of that bond polarity. So it's directly proportional to the size of the charges, and it's directly proportional to the distance between them. So mu, this is how we uh, represent a dipole moment, mu. The dipole moment is equal to q, which is the size of the charge. Is it plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3? What's the magnitude of the charge? Multiplied by r, which is the distance in between the two atoms. So as the charge gets larger, and as the distance between the two atoms becomes larger, then the dipole moment becomes larger. So how polar a bond is has to do with the size of the partial charges and the distance between them. And so the, dist the bond, the distance between two atoms is a function of how big those atoms are. Small atoms are very close together, so R is small, and large atoms are much further apart because they're so large they can't get very close together. So R is larger for large atoms. So we can say generally the more electrons two atoms share and the larger the atoms are, the larger the dipole moment. So we measure dipole moment with a unit called Debye, which is a capital D. So it would have some value, we'd say it would be 3.8 Debye. That would be the value of that dipole moment. So when we look at um, whether or not a molecule is polar, we have to take into account every single polar bond in that molecule. So let's start with an easy one that only has one bond. In HCl, this is a complete molecule, um, the Cl is more electronegative than H. If we bring up our table of electronegativity values, we'd see that chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0 and hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Now depending on which table you're looking at, sometimes those values are a little bit different. Sometimes they have two numbers after the decimal point, so hydrogen might be 2.05 and chlorine might be 3.10. So sometimes there are uh, two numbers after the decimal, and sometimes the values between different tables aren't exactly the same. But we can say that generally H is about 2.1, and CL is about 3.0, given that they might be slightly different depending on which table we're looking at. That difference is still 
So when I have a difference of 0.9, remember if it's greater than, if it's 0.5 or greater, that means I have a polar bond. So the polar bond means that this side is going to be partial negative, and this side is going to be partial positive because the chlorine is more electronegative, so it's stealing the electrons in this bond. All the electrons in this bond are being pulled towards chlorine. So we can represent that like this by showing the electron cloud has been deformed. Around hydrogen, the electron cloud is really small, but around chlorine, the electron cloud is really large. That shows that the electron spends most of its time over here, and the electron does not spend much time, the electrons in that bond do not spend much time over here. So we put partial minus, partial plus, and we would show this sign right here, this symbol that has an arrow, it, it points on one end, and it has kind of a cross on the other end. This is called the dipole moment, this, this, sig this symbol right here. So um, when I have a dipole moment, I point the arrow at the more electronegative atom. Cl is, has a bigger value of electronegativity. The arrow points toward that atom. And over here, where it kind of looks like a plus, right? kind of like a plus sign, that's next to the atom that's losing electrons that becomes positive. So this is one way to represent that this bond is polar. I draw a dipole moment that's parallel with the bond. See how these two lines are parallel? And the one arrow points towards the electronegative atom and away from the electropositive atom. Another way I can represent that uh, polarity is with partial minus, partial plus which is another way of saying this. This is partial plus, this is partial minus. That means there's a separation of charge, there's a polar bond. And a third way is with this um, electron cloud. We can see that the electron cloud is small over here and large over here. Those are all three ways of saying the same thing, which is that the electrons are spending their time unequally. It's an uneven sharing of electrons. Okay, now let's take a look at a compound that has two bonds here. This is carbon dioxide, CO2, and uh, when I draw the Lewis structure for CO2, I'm left with um, a structure that looks like this. Now we can fill in the lone pairs here. I have two lone pairs on this oxygen, and two lone pairs on this oxygen, and zero lone pairs on carbon. So when I put the uh, when I look at the electronegativity values here, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. So the difference between carbon and oxygen is a value of one, the difference in electronegativity values, which makes this bond polar. Remember, anything 0.5 or greater is polar. So that means that this side is partial minus because the number is bigger, and this side is partial plus because the number is smaller. Now, we have to do the same thing on the other side because we have two bonds. So now, carbon is still 2.5, and this oxygen on this side is also 3.5 because oxygens always are. So the difference over on the right side we saw was one. The difference on the left side is also one because they're the same atoms. So then we can say the same thing over here, that this is partial minus, and the carbon's partial plus, and this oxygen's partial minus. Both of these bonds are polar. So here I have two polar bonds. Is the molecule polar? So, so far I haven't answered this question. Is the whole molecule polar? The only question I've answered is, is this bond polar? Yes. Is this bond polar? Yes. So this compound has two polar bonds. Is, it, is the whole compound polar? Well, we have to do, we have to look closer. Now that I've determined that this molecule ha looks like this, I drew the Lewis structure. I put the electronegativity values for each atom on here, and I see the difference here. We, we have to do each bond separately. So don't add up the oxygens. That, it's not 2.5 minus 7. We always do this bond, we always have to do each bond separately. So this bond, 2.5 minus 3.5, and then this bond, 2.5 minus 3.5. So now that I've determined that uh, I know the Lewis structure and I know that it has two polar bonds, the next step is what is the geometry? The valence shell electron pair repulsion geometry, V S E P R. So Remember that to determine the geometry, 
on a molecule, we have to count the number of electron groups. So remember, electron groups are double, single, and triple bonds all count as one, and a lone pair of electrons counts as one. So how many electron groups do I have around the central atom? One, two. The double bond counts as one. This double bond counts as one, so there are two electron groups. So two electron groups. Remember that electrons are all negative and they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So if I have two electron groups, as far away from each other as possible means 180 degrees, and we call that geometry linear. All right, so we've got 180 up here, and this bond is also 180. This is a linear molecule. So now I know that I have a linear molecule. The bonds are 180 degrees apart. So now I don't care about the molecule anymore. Now I'm going to ignore the molecule. To answer if this molecule is polar, I don't need to know that anymore. All I need to know is this. All right, I have one dipole moment that points this way, C to O. And I have one dipole moment that points this way, C to O, on the other side. And these are 180 degrees apart because the molecule is linear. So just like a plus and a minus will cancel each other out, so that if I have one positive charge and one negative charge in a compound, that compound is actually neutral. There's no charge because the plus and the minus cancel each other out. If I have two dipole moments, and those two dipole moments are perfectly opposed to each other, one points perfectly to the right, one points perfectly to the left, they're the exact same size because C and O yield a, an electronegativity difference of one. So this dipole moment is one unit large, and this dipole moment is one unit large, 3.5 minus 2.5. So they're the exact same size, and they're perfectly opposed. That means that they cancel each other out. So this molecule has two polar bonds. Two polar bonds. But it is not a polar molecule. So that is surprising. We would think that if you see a polar bond in a molecule, then we would say, or, then we'd say, yeah, that molecule is polar. It has a polar bond. So it's surprising that a molecule can have polar bonds and still not be polar. So I mean, the way that's not surprising is if a molecule has zero polar bonds, then do you think it's a polar molecule? No, not a polar molecule. So if something does not have any polar bonds, well, yeah, that makes sense. It's not a polar molecule. It doesn't have any polar bonds, so it's not a polar molecule. But it's surprising that something that does have polar bonds is still not a polar molecule because those bonds are situated in such a way that they cancel each other out. So we'll, let's stick with our, um, our metaphor here, or our analogy with the charges. You might think that if a molecule has charges on it, then it is definitely a charged molecule. I have a plus, I have a minus, that's a charged molecule, there are charges on it. Well, no, it's not, because the plus and the minus cancel out so that the whole particle is neutral. So this is the same idea. If I have two polar bonds, you might say, oh, well, it's definitely polar, but that's not the case, because if they're situated in the right way, they cancel out. So now let's, let's put that, push that analogy a little bit further. What if I have a particle that only has one charge? The particle has just a plus, or just a minus. Is it a charged particle? Yes, definitely, because if it has just one plus, there's no minus there to cancel it out. It's charged. If it has just one minus, there's no plus there to cancel it out. It's charged. Its overall charge is minus. Its overall charge is plus. So we can say the same thing with dipole moments. If I have one dipole moment in a, in a molecule, is that molecule polar? Yes, definitely. So here's one dipole moment. Is this molecule polar? Yes, because there's nothing here to cancel this out. So in order to have a, a bond 
a molecule that has polar bonds but is not polar, it needs to have more than one polar bond. A molecule that only has one polar bond is always polar. But a molecule that has two polar bonds might not be polar if the distance between the angle between those polar bonds is 180 degrees. Let's look at another example. Here's water. It has two bonds. The two bonds in water are not at 180 degrees because after we draw the um, Lewis structure for water, we get this here with these two lone pairs. So let's go back to our, our table and see what this gives us. Right now I have two bonds and two lone pairs on the central atom. Remember, I only care about the central atom. Two bonds, two lone pairs. All together, that's four groups. All right, so let's go look at our chart. Two bonds. Here we go. Electron groups, four. So here's all the entries where I have four electron groups. I can either have four bonds and zero pairs, three bonds and one lone pair, or two bonds and two lone pairs. Those are all the way, different ways that I can have four electron groups. So we said I have in water I have two bonds and two electron groups. Two lone, excuse me, two bonds and two lone pairs. So that gives me an electron geometry of tetrahedral. Anytime I have four electron groups, I always have a tetrahedral electron geometry. But when I look at the atoms that are actually there, if I have four atoms, I have a tetrahedral molecular geometry. If I have three atoms around the central atom, it's not a tetrahedral molecular geometry. Now it kind of looks like a pyramid. So I call this trigonal pyramidal. And if I have two bonds and two lone pairs, it's still tetrahedral because it still has four groups all together. But since only two of them are bonds, then I call that shape bent. Because I'm just looking at the atoms that are there. This looks like bent. It doesn't look like a tetrahedron. So what are the angles between all of these? They're about 109.5. Remember, when I have a lone pair on top, the lone pair takes up more space and it pushes those bonds closer together. So when they're all bonds, exactly 109.5. When there's a lone pair on top, less than 109.5. When there's two lone pairs on top, even less than that. So this is about 107 and water is about 105. So the angle gets squeezed because those lone pairs take up more space. All right, so we know that the angle in water in H2O here, this angle is about 105 degrees, right? It's a little bit squished because those lone pairs are, are compressing that angle. So I look, I do my electronegativity analysis like I did in the last one. Oxygen is 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1, each hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen is 1.4. So that makes this a polar bond with a difference of 1.4. This right here, 3.5 minus 2.1, that's also a polar bond. And we'll put this, the magnitude here is 1.4. So again, remember the last step, now that I have determined that I know the geometry, I know the angle, I know that I have two polar bonds, now I can ignore all of this stuff and just redraw the two polar bonds. First, I'll, I'll uh, show that this one's kind of opposite of CO2, right? In CO2, the central atom was less electronegative, and the O's were more electronegative, so these arrows pointed towards the O's on the outside, right? See? Point towards the O because the O is more electronegative. But with water, the O is still more electronegative, and it's in the middle now. So now these arrows point toward the middle. So I look at my arrows, and the only way that they can uh, cancel each other out is if it's, they're perfectly opposed and perfectly symmetric. So these are not perfectly opposed. Remember, the last time they had to be 180 degrees apart. And so what we can do, the way that we can look at this and determine, are these, uh, are these arrows perfectly opposed or not? So we can kind of create a grid here when, when I look at these arrows. Let me maybe make the grid in a different color. 
kind of have a grid here with these arrows. So are these arrows, um, if they were perfectly opposed, then I would be able to um, summarize their position by saying they're either pointing up, or they're pointing down, or they're pointing left, or they're pointing right. Okay, so this one right here is pointing up and to the right. This one right here is pointing up and to the left. So this one's pointing to the right, and this one's pointing to the left. So right and left are opposites. So when I add right and left together, they cancel out. Rightness, the rightness and the leftness of this one. This one points right and this one points left. So when I add those two, these are called vectors. When I add these two vectors together, the right plus the left part cancels out. But what do I have left? This is um, right plus up. And this is left plus up. Right plus left equals zero. Up plus up equals up. All right, if I wanted this to cancel, right plus left equals zero, up plus down equals zero. So if I wanted these, uh, if I wanted these vectors to cancel, if I was trying to see if they were going to cancel, I would need a vector that pointed to the right, like this one, but that also points down. Right, this one points to the right and down. This one points to the right and up. So right and left will cancel, but up plus up does not cancel. I need up plus down to cancel. So bear with me for a second. I know this is, seems like I'm kind of talking, <laughs> talking in circles here. So the, the point is that these two dipole moments, because of the way that they're oriented, that they're not perfectly opposed. They're perfectly opposed as concerns their rightness and their leftness but they're not perfectly opposed as concerns that they're both pointing up. This one points up, and this one points up. They both point up towards oxygen. So what that means is that in this molecule, and here I'll, we'll, we'll go over this, this is called vector addition, how I determined whether or not this was gonna actually be polar. We'll go over that here in just a minute. So here we have two polar bonds in water. And yes, a polar molecule. So let's just look at these examples again. I just want to summarize what, where we've been. One polar bond equals polar molecule. The molecule must be polar if there's only one polar bond, because this one's pointing to the right. In order to cancel this, I would need one that points to the left. There isn't anything else here. So this is not opposed by anything. Therefore, this molecule is polar. I could have two dipole moments. If I have two dipole moments, is the molecule polar? Maybe. If the two, di oops, if the two dipole moments are perfectly opposed, such that they're, this one points to the right, and this one points to the left. This one does not point up or down. This one does not point up or down. So the leftness and the rightness of these two cancel each other out, and this becomes a nonpolar molecule. Those dipoles are perfectly opposed. They're symmetric. Here I have two dipole moments, and the molecule is polar. Because when I add this dipole moment and this dipole moment, when I add them together, the resulting dipole moment does not point left or right because the leftness and the rightness of the resulting dipole gets canceled because the, they are opposed in that sense. But they're both pointing up. So you can see right here, this dipole moment in the middle that's kind of dotted, this is the resulting vector. If I add this arrow plus this arrow together, they create this arrow. The arrow points up. So if the arrow points up, that means that this molecule has a net dipole and the two bonds add together to create a dipole moment that points straight up. So these are bond dipole moments. In order to know if there's a molecular dipole moment, 
know why I made those blue. In order to know if there is a molecular dipole moment, which is what happens when you add the polar, the dipole moments from the bonds together, we have to do what's called vector addition. So I'm, here are the steps. Draw a Lewis structure for H2O, right? You're going to go through the steps to draw a Lewis structure. Put the two lone pairs up here. Then you're going to say, are these bonds polar? So then we're going to look at our electronegativity chart, and I'm going to find 3.5, 2.1. So yes, these bonds are polar. The dipole moments are parallel to the bonds. See how they're par parallel to the bonds? They're parallel to this bond and it points toward the more electronegative atom. So now I've made my Lewis structure, I've drawn in my dipole moments according to whether or not it's polar, and it is, and now finally I have to do vector addition. Uh, oh, excuse me, I skipped a step. Now I need to know what's the geometry. I know that they're polar, and I do the geometry, which says it's tetrahedral. Tetra, I'm going to run out of room here. Hedral slash bent. So now that I know that it's tetrahedral slash bent, and I know that this angle is 105 degrees, now I do vector addition on my two dipole moments. These are also called vectors. So I'll do, I'll add these two vectors together, and I'll see if there's a resulting vector. And in this case, there is a resulting vector. Therefore, this molecule is polar. All right. Now let's look a little bit more closely at vector addition. So a vector, we know how to add together numbers, right? When I, this vector is plus five magnitude, it's plus, it's plus five big, and this one is plus five big. If I add together plus five and plus five, I get a vector that's plus 10, right? Um, so a vector is a value that has not only a magnitude, we call this a magnitude, it's how big it is, but it also has a direction. A dipole moment, we can say how big it is, how long it is, and we can say what direction is it pointing. Is it pointing up or down or left or right? So when I add together vectors, I not only have to add their numbers together, how big they are, plus 5 and plus 5 to get plus 10, I also have to add together their directions. Right plus right equals right. I add two vectors together that are pointing in the same direction, then they're just going to get bigger. Plus 5 to the right, plus 5 to the right, equals plus 10 to the right. That's how I would add those two vectors together. Here's another example. Plus 10. Now this one's longer. It's a plus 10 to the right. And here I have a, uh, this one's pointing to the left. So in order to show that this is to the right and this is to the left and they're opposed to each other, in numbers, I say plus and minus, because plus and minus are opposed to each other. So if it's going to the right, just, um, you know, we read left to right, so we can say when, when something's traveling this way, it's positive. So this one is twice as big as A, and so we'll call it 10. And since it's going from left to right, we'll call it plus 10. This one's half the size, so we'll call it 5, and it's pointing the other direction, to the left, so we'll call it minus 5. So when I add these two vectors together, look what happens. The minus 5, the 5 that points to the left, cuts off the five, the, uh, 5 of these that are pointing to the right. So minus 5 and plus 5 get canceled. So if minus 5, and I'll cut this one in half and say that this is two plus 5s, minus 5 and this plus 5 are going to cancel each other out. But then I still have this one left over, which still points to the right, and then now it's 0.5, because it's, uh, or excuse me, plus 5, because it's um, half as big as it was. So finally, let's look at the last example down here. Plus 5, it points to the right. Minus 5, it points to the left. They're exactly the same size. One points exactly to the right. One points exactly to the left. Plus 5 and minus 5 equals 0. The vectors exactly cancel. There is no vector left. They cancel. So if I add two vectors pointing the same direction, they get bigger. If I add two vectors pointing opposite directions, they get smaller. 
And if I add two vectors that are exactly the same size and they point opposite directions, then they cancel out and they go to zero. So this looks like what we had in CO2. I have a, a one that points to this oxygen and one that points to this oxygen, and they're 180 degrees apart. They perfectly cancel. That's a nonpolar molecule. OK, so let's take another look at what happens when I have angles. So this one is pointing up, and this one is pointing to the right. So we can use what's called the parallelogram method. And in the parallelogram method, you just draw a dotted line that's parallel to this vector from the tip of this one. And you draw a, par a dotted line that's parallel to this vector from the tip of this one. And where they meet, that is where the new vector is going to point. So the new vector is exactly in the middle of these two. See how it's halfway between these two. So the new vector goes halfway in between those two. And it gets bigger because they're both kind of pointing in the same direction. So the resulting vector is going to get bigger. Here's another one. We draw, draw the parallelogram again, tip to tail. So this one um, is parallel to this line. And this line is parallel to this one. And where they meet, where those dotted lines meet, that's where the new vector is going to point. It's halfway in between the old vectors. So for example, if I just put a vector here and I put a vector here, then what's my resulting vector going to look like? Well, I draw the dotted lines and show that right there is where they're going to cross. So my new vector is right there at the corner when I add them together, and it's bigger. So this plus this equals this. All right, so let's see how that works in terms of different molecular geometries. This geometry is called linear, so this is representative of a molecule, but some of these others aren't necessarily. So let's look at some examples here where it's really just molecules that we're looking at. OK, a molecule with an, a geometry that's linear would have dipole moments that are arranged like this. They would be 180 degrees apart. They would perfectly cancel. Vector addition would leave us with 0 right here. If I have a trigonal planar molecule, B, F, 3. Here is um, CO2. All right, so if I have a linear molecule, it looks like this, nonpolar. The two dipole moments cancel out. If I have a trigonal planar molecule like BF3, write these over here, CO2, BF3. BF3 has polar bonds because the difference between B and F is large. But if they're arranged in exactly this pattern, so that there's 120 degrees between each of them, then they perfectly cancel out. This is how I add three vectors together. And how does this work? Well, let's, let's watch. If I have this vector right here, what happens when I add this one and this one? What happens when I add those two? Well, I'll do the parallelogram method. Right, and it's going to give me a line that looks like that when I add those two together. Now look, I've added this one and this one together, and it gave me this. What happens if I add this and this? They cancel out exactly. This one points up and to the right. This one points down and to the left. They perfectly cancel. So adding these two together gives me this one, and adding this one and this one gives me 0. So this that shows you that this is perfectly symmetric, and all of those cancel out. Let's look at tetrahedral. Tetrahedral, remember, this is three-dimensional, so it's kind of hard to see. But if I add together this one and this one, then I'm going to get one that looks like this. All right, if I add together that and that, I get this one in the middle. and change colors here. And if I add together this one and this one, then I get one that kind of points this way. Now look, the red one and the green one are perfectly opposed. So they perfectly cancel out. And this might be C, F, 4. Right? This one, oops. Remember, sometimes when we're drawing something that's three-dimensional, we use these symbols. The dash goes backwards. The wedge comes forwards. So this molecule, CF4, 
would be nonpolar, even though it has one, two, three, four polar bonds, all of those bonds are polar, the molecule is not polar because it's perfectly symmetric. This molecule, all of those bonds are polar, the molecule is not polar because it's perfectly symmetric. This molecule, polar bonds, nonpolar molecule. So let's look at this next one. So here I have two bonds, two bonds, and they're shaped like this. This would be for like a bent molecule. So I'll draw water upside down here. So with water, I've got one dipole moment that points like this and one dipole moment that points like this. So that's kind of the same thing here. What happens when I add those two together? They're going to get bigger and they're going to point down. So I kind of drew this one opposite, right? So I add these two together and the, air, the resulting dipole is going to point down. So that means this is polar because this and this do not perfectly cancel. I've added them together to make a, one that points down. I don't have one up here that points up. If I don't have one up here that's pointing up, then there's nothing to cancel this. And if there's nothing to cancel this, then the molecule is polar. All right, so let's look at this last one down here, trigonal pyramidal. That's like NF3. So I've got N and I can draw, this one kind of pops out at us. This one kind of goes back here, F, F, F. And this has a lone pair. I should have drawn these lone pairs on water. Remember water has these two lone pairs too on the oxygen. One. Come on, let me draw a dot. Two. And this one has a lone pair. So then when I draw these, uh, vectors. I get one that's parallel to the N and the F. I get one that goes this way and I get one that goes this way. So when I add all three of those together, they're all pointing down, right? So when I add this blue one and this blue one and this blue one together, they, they're all pointing down. Their leftness and rightness gets perfectly canceled so that the resulting red vector that I'm left with points straight down. So when I have N, F, 3, and all of those vectors add together to give me a vector that points straight down after I add them all together. There is no vector on top to balance this one, to cancel this one out, so this is polar. So I want to show you a little shortcut now, because this looks more complicated than it is. CO2. has zero lone pairs on the carbon, right? BF3 has zero lone pairs on the boron. They're all bonds, right? Uh, CF4 has zero lone pairs on the central atom. No lone pairs on carbon. Water, H2O, two lone pairs. Nitrogen, NF3, one lone pair. So look at this. The ones that have zero lone pairs are nonpolar. Because when they have bonds, only bonds, all of the bonds are always perfectly symmetric because that's what valence shell electron pair repulsion theory shows us, is that when they are all bonds, they are all equally spaced, and all equally spaced bonds all cancel out. Nonpolar, nonpolar, nonpolar. Now the ones that are polar have lone pairs. Two lone pairs, polar. One lone pair, polar. So if you have determined that a bond has, let's, let's make, a, make a flow chart here, okay. Is a, is a molecule polar? So, does the molecule, 
does it have polar bonds? Yes? No. If it doesn't have polar bonds, then not polar. If it does have polar bonds, then does it have lone pairs? Does the central atom have lone pairs? Does the central atom have lone pairs? Yes. Polar. No, not polar. So here's a little flow chart to determine if a molecule is polar. We've got to figure out if it has polar bonds. And if it does have polar bonds, then we look at the central atom to see if it has lone pairs. And if it does, then the vector addition is going to show us that, th that one of those vectors does not cancel, and therefore the whole molecule is polar. So when you look back at your chart here, anyone, CO2, zero lone pairs, nonpolar. Zero lone pairs, BF3, we already said that one's nonpolar. Zero lone pairs, CH4 or CF4, nonpolar. All bonds, nonpolar. All bonds, nonpolar. All bonds, nonpolar. This has a lone pair in the middle. This one would be polar if those bonds are polar. This one has a lone pair. It would be polar. This one has two lone pairs. It would be polar. We can go down through the chart and show that the ones the the arrangements that only have bonds. So as we go through this chart, we can see that any time a shape has polar bonds, but it has zero lone pairs, then it's nonpolar. This, if it has polar bonds and it has one lone pair, yes polar. Polar bonds, two lone pairs, yes, polar. Polar bonds, three lone pairs. In this case, no, again, because look at the shape, it's linear. So this one and this one are going to cancel. Here, this one and this one will cancel, but there's nothing to cancel this one on the bottom. Same with octahedral. If I have six polar bonds like this, but they're zero lone pairs, nonpolar. They all perfectly cancel. One lone pair, polar. Two lone pairs, look at this shape. What do you think? Is this polar or nonpolar? This one would be nonpolar because this and this would cancel, perfectly opposed, and this and this would cancel, perfectly opposed. Both of these bond angles are 180, so they would be perfectly opposed and they'd cancel, and a compound like this would be nonpolar. So, again, draw the Lewis structure and determine the molecular geometry. Determine whether the bonds in the molecule are polar by looking at the electronegativity. And then you can determine whether the, bond, whether the polar bonds add together to give a net dipole moment by utilizing vector addition.